This glass dome holds a grisly relic. The hand belongs to a martyred saint. Can it work miracles? Is this the true face of Jesus Christ? How was this photographic image imprinted centuries ago on the Turin Shroud? The people of Naples live in fear of the power of their patron saint. But does this reliquary really hold the blood of Saint Januarius? Sri Lanka is a melting pot of religions where Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims and Christians live and worship side by side. Every year, one of the world's most spectacular festivals takes place in Kandy, the ancient hill capital. It's called the Perahera, and its centerpiece is a colorful procession of elephants. The Perahera is held in honor of the Lord Buddha, one of whose teeth is preserved inside a set of magnificent jeweled caskets. This tooth is just one of countless sacred relics revered throughout the world. Many are believed to possess miraculous powers. At Our Lady of Peace Church in Manhattan, an expectant congregation hopes to witness miracles. Father Peter Mary Rookie has been in the healing business for 45 years. He seems to exercise a strange power over his flock. He believes the secret lies hidden inside this cross. It contains fragments of bones from seven saints. Father Peter Mary claims these relics can bring comfort to the afflicted. Gift of tears, that's a beautiful gift. <laughs> Let the tears flow. Let the tears flow. Thank you, Jesus. The relics are very powerful and always have been by blessing people uh, with uh, our saints and their relics. The, uh, people were healed. So, uh, more powerful than that, you cannot say, I guess. Sticks to somebody here for a minute, okay? Thank you. Placing this reliquary crucifix upon them and blessing them with our saints. We have seen the blind recover their sight and the deaf hear and the lame walk. For this man at least, the relics appear to have worked wonders, whether through unearthly intervention or mere coincidence. Sister Gregory of the Bar Convent is custodian of Britain's greatest hoard of relics. She's lost count of how many she has. There are two classes of relics. There are first-class relics, which are actually part of the saint or the martyr. Uh, a bit of his bone, a bit of his hair, a bit of his flesh. Uh, then there are second-class relics, which are very much more common, and those consist of a bit of the clothing, or perhaps something that's just touched the body. This is the skull of St. Victor, a Roman martyr. We see he was a martyr from the palm around his, his skull. And here we have a very large collection of small relics. Now, this is um, a little bit of the bone of St. Cecilia, and that is uh, certainly a first-class relic because it is part of her body. And this, again, is um, part of the body of St. Agnes. Some uh, saints, uh, as soon as they died, people were trying to uh, take part of their bodies. St. Teresa of Avila, um, her community had very great difficulty in getting her buried because people were lying in wait to take parts of her body in a really quite gruesome way. I can't say that I have a, a favourite, but I suppose perhaps, if anything, Margaret Clithrow's ham, because I do admire her enormously as a very, very brave woman. Margaret Clitheroe was a 16th century butcher's wife in York. She became a Catholic when it was against the law to do so. For giving sanctuary to persecuted priests, she was condemned to a barbaric death. Crushed beneath enormous weights, she took 15 minutes to die. 
Her body was then thrown on a dunghill as a sign of disrespect, but after some days it was rescued by her friends and they took off the hand and for about um, 200 years it was kept in a little wooden box and then it was put into this reliquary and sealed in. I don't know that any flesh could exist in those circumstances for 400 years. I think it must be supernatural. Of all the world's religious relics, the most studied is a length of cloth kept at Turin in Italy. It's said to have wrapped the body of Christ after he was crucified, and pilgrims have been flocking to venerate it for more than 400 years. The search for the truth about the Turin Shroud has caused bitter controversy among scientists and believers. The shroud is considered so sacred that it's kept under top security in a sealed box in Turing Cathedral. A mass is held in its honor every year. The linen cloth is 14 feet long. The first certain record of it dates from the Middle Ages when it belonged to a crusader knight. He put it on show and claimed it had wrapped the body of Christ. But there were skeptics even then. Pope Clement VII dismissed it as only a painting. But this man's work restored believers' faith. In 1898, Secondo Pier took a photograph of this, but in his dark room, this appeared. The negative image shook the Christian world. To millions, it is the true image of Christ. An international center in Turin is devoted to the study of the shroud. Its director is Professor Bruno Barberis. The reason that we can assure that it was a crucified man is due to the fact that we have a lot of sign connected with the crucifixion. crucifixion. In particular, we can see these wounds on the wrist, which is a characteristic of the, a nail used for the crucifixion. We can see a lot of blood, the blood coming down from uh, the wounds of the, of the wrist and going along the arms. We have to understand that the arms in the crucified position is vertical and not in this position, obviously. We see also some other blood coming to some wounds uh, on the front and on the back of the head. They are due to uh, a, a crowd of thorns. We can see also on the back, on all the back until, until to the feet, a lot of sign due to uh, the flagellation. It was a surely a Roman flagellation because the number of that ones are more than 120. On the contrary, the uh, Jews' flagellation stops at 39. There is a very, very strong probability that these two men, Jesus of Nazareth, as written in the Gospel, and the men of the Shroud, as we can see in this cloth, are the same person. In 1978, the Church allowed an international team of scientists to study the Shroud at close quarters. To reveal its underside, the Sisters of St. Joseph snipped it from its backing. With sticky tape, the scientists lifted tiny fibers from the blood-like stains. A few precious samples were sent to Dr. Walter McCrone. His institute in Chicago specializes in microscopic analysis, and McCrone knows as much about blood stains as anyone else on Earth. In the search for truth, he gave up Christmas Day to study the fibers. The first thing that I did when I got the tapes back here to Chicago was to take a look at them under the microscope. This is one of the shroud tapes and the particles uh, on the individual fibers then are apparent immediately, particularly in bloodstain areas, there are more of them there. Went to higher and higher magnifications to be sure that uh, I was seeing everything that I needed to see and realized very soon that they were not blood. What I was seeing were very fine particles, red, deep red in color. I'd seen this particular substance many times before. I worked a lot on Rembrandts and Raphaels and Titians, other paintings, and this is just 
red ochre. In order to be sure, Macrone prepared two solutions, one of his own dilute blood, the other of red ochre. He painted them onto linen cloth and prepared microscopic slides. First, he looked at the real blood. When I look at this, magnification right now is about 800 times. And I see on the surface of this blood painted fibers, brownish smear of something that uh, is not at all small particles. It's a continuous smeared layer over the surface and actually gluing apparently several of these fibers together. I then decided to compare this with this slide of red ochre painted spot. I'm now looking at fibers that look very different from those from the blood painted area. These fibers all show individual tiny, very dark little red particles. Very, very different from any smeared coating of, of the blood. They look, in other words, exactly like the fibers and the particles that I saw with the shroud. I don't think I have any doubt that the shroud then and the red ochre painted spots are identical and therefore the shroud is a painting. But the believers would not be convinced. Ten years later, the church agreed to the ultimate test. Carbon-14 dating would at last establish when the cloth was made. But this meant doing the unthinkable, cutting the sacred shroud. Samples were sent to laboratories in three different countries. Their verdict was unanimous. The shroud is medieval. But establishing when the Turin shroud was made has still left one question unanswered. How was the image created? In California, Sam Pellicori thinks he knows. He is convinced that a real corpse made the image, even if the body was not Christ's. The hypothesis is that it's a result of a direct contact between the skin of the corpse and the linen. The skin of the corpse contains perspiration and body oils, and I believe these help stimulate the yellowing, the degradation of the linen. I've tested the theory by uh, employing a student to work up a, a good healthy sweat. Uh, this produces uh, the body oils and perspiration products that uh, a uh, stressed body would, uh, would produce. And then lightly uh, applying the linen to the, the skin uh, and the linen picks up a very uh, minute amount of the perspiration or oils. And in the case of the shroud, this latent image perhaps took tens of years to develop and become visible. What I'm doing here with this experiment is accelerating that naturally occurring process. The yellowing of cellulose is a naturally occurring process. It does not require the presence of pigments or any other artistic application. We have applied well-known uh, cellulose chemistry and uh, it seems to fit, it seems to fit very well. This appears to be the beard, um, the eyes, and uh, his hair. I think we've solved at least one of the mysteries of the Shroud of Turin, probably the most fascinating one, namely how the image was produced. On the other side of America, shroud skeptics need only a plaster face, a wet linen cloth, and some nifty finger work. The fingers belong to university lecturer Joe Nickel. So even, even just, just in a moment's work, we've, we've begun to see what it looks like. And then we eliminate, do we keep working it as it dries? Once the cloth is thoroughly dry, we can now take the pigment, which we've prepared from red iron oxide uh, 
and we simply apply this to the high spots. As we apply the, uh, the pigment, we see the prominences becoming darkened and the re deeper recesses are missed. This will begin now to make a negative image. These materials are exactly what a forger working in the middle of the 14th century would have had available. A bas-relief cloth in the herringbone tool pattern, uh, a simple dauber, and some uh, earth pigments, iron, iron earth pigments. Certainly this is a plausible explanation for the shroud image. This is what we end up with. And of course, it's still taking on some of the shape of the relief, but, but that's the image. Now when we take a photograph of this and reverse the negative, we reverse the darks and lights, and this is what we get the shroud photographed. On New York's 9th Avenue, retired chemist Raymond Drakoff is about to put his own shroud-making theory to the test. The requirements are a bronze bust of Dante and a friendly Italian baker. How you doing, Ray? Get everything ready. Come on in. Follow me. Okay, Ray, so what uh what are you gonna do? Uh I'm gonna try to bake the statue, put it in a hot oven, uh-huh, get it up to about 600 degrees, and then we'll take it out and we'll work on it from there. Put them in the inferno. All right. 600 degrees warm enough for you? I think it's going to be warm enough, at least as a first try. OK. We'll put it in uh, for you. Yeah. You can put it in. Into the bowels of hell. There you go. The idea came from the fact that the image is a negative. And obviously these people had no access to such thing like photography. So the only way that could have happened to create an image was to take a very hot statue, place a cloth on it, and scorch the features. The statue that we have selected has prominent features. It has an aquiline nose, uh, a strong jaw, and this would probably be easy to show on a cloth. Cloth? Need the gloves? And probably use a glove, maybe. Does it matter which way you put the, the, the cloth on to get no. a different impression or, a, no. or the type of cloth? The type of cloth, we try to get as close as possible as to the cloth that might have been used in the Holy Land at that time. Uh-huh. Natural linen. All right, let's give it, let's take it off. Okay. Another image. I think what we have to do is to put it in the oven again and run it as hot as possible. I think you're going to make history, Ray. This time, Raymond uses a wet cloth. This will be Ray, more dramatic think... because it will, you will see the steam rising. Make perhaps a better image. The burning image of Christ. It looks like a death mask on it. That's what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So you think it was just corrupt bakers in the Middle Ages that were doing this? Or corrupt what? bakers, it could have been that, it could have been statue Cor makers. Corrupt bakers from Turin, huh? All right. Okay, we get. It's about the same image. Okay. Hey, Joe, it's gonna be easier if I show you down here and we see the correspondence of the features. The headband here, the crest, the eyebrow, the nose, the sallow cheeks, which corresponds to that on the image of Christ. And the nose, is the shape of the, of the scorch mark yeah. is close to the shape of the nose as we see it. It looks like the Shroud of Turin. It looks like the Shroud of Turin. You sold me, Ray. It's the Shroud of Ninth Avenue. Even to science, the most rational of disciplines, the blood of St. Januarius presents an intriguing challenge.
Twice a year, the city of Naples waits to learn its destiny. This phial is said to contain the blood of St. Januarius, Naples' patron saint. In an anxious procession, the Neapolitans carry the reliquary through the streets of the city. St. Januarius was beheaded in the fourth century. According to legend, his blood was saved and has miraculous properties. Against all the laws of science, it can turn from solid to liquid. The faithful dread the times the miracle fails. In history, disaster has followed. Plague, pestilence and famine. The blood stays clotted. The tension rises. Doctors and chemists know that when blood is poured into a container, it's impossible for it to liquefy and solidify over and over again. So, either the blood of St. Januarius really is miraculous, or there's some other explanation. Two scientists, Luigi Garlaschelli and Sergio Della Sala, believe they found the answer over a hamburger. They claim the blood is thixotropic. They'd seen something similar in the cafe. Well, the first thing um, crossed our mind is um, ketchup sauce. Uh, as you can see, ketchup is solid, and if you think what you have to do when you use it, you don't just pour it as you do with water. You um, vibrate it or mechanically agitate it until it becomes more fluid, until when you can use it on top of your, of your pizza or on your hamburger. And if you let it stand for a while, it will resolidify again. I couldn't resist. I had to try to find out what textotropic solution or substances uh, I could use and possibly using medieval materials and I just wanted to have my personal miracle in my lab. Gala Skelly began with a simple solution of ferric chloride and water. Ferric chloride now is a very cheap and common chemical you can buy it in a drugstore but in the Middle Ages, the only place where you can find it in nature was on active volcanoes, like, for example, Mount Vesuvius. He added crushed eggshell, the medieval version of calcium carbonate, then purified the solution through a bladder and left it to evaporate. What happens is that this solution, after a while, will become a gel, like this, for example. It's a thick gel. You can turn it upside down and it's solid. But once it's shaken, it will become fluid and more and more fluid. And I had reproduced a miracle in my lab, a miracle of science. The miracle of God is more elusive. But after two days of prayer, the Neapolitan's patience is finally rewarded. <laughs> Naples can rest easy till the next time. I've been wary of miracles since I heard the following story. Not long ago, people in this part of the world rushed to buy water from a miraculous spring bubbling up in the sea. Only later did scientific tests reveal the stomach-churning truth. The holy water came from a broken sewage pipe. As for religious relics, I believe that most are fakes, but many are perfectly genuine. It doesn't really matter. For true believers, they'll work anyway. Thank you.